Hello, Professor Bruce McGraw is an active member of American Academia, Philosophy, Religious Studies, Humanities, and Mythology, and other aspects of scientific life. Bruce won first place awards from the San Diego Press Club for Best Series, Best Commentary, and Best Science Environmental Writing. Bruce McGraw is about to publish a book titled The Magical Universe, Answering the Call of Climate Change for Global and Personal Transformation. Also, he runs the website the magical universe new mythology.com. So, uh, please tell us about your um, academic life uh, and also tell us about your book. Okay, well, I teach in the uh, community colleges now, primarily in, at uh, Palomar College and uh, Cuyamaca, and I teach a variety of subjects from different religious studies classes to philosophy classes to mythology classes. I taught, I've been teaching a course on the New Testament, um, done humanities classes. So um, I've done a lot of, quite a wide variety of, uh, of subjects in, the, in, in that general area. So that's why my book is kind of an all encompassing book. So it's really kind of, my original title, uh, my first book uh, I wrote was The New Mythology. I haven't published that one yet, but that was a longer and much more detail. And a couple of people read that book and decided that it was too detailed and people would get lost in the details. So I decided, okay, I put that one aside. So I decided to write a smaller book. So I wrote this new one, which I entitled The Magical Universe. That's kind of a, a briefer summation. So this one's a little under 20,000 words. The bigger one is about 72,000 words. So I thought I would go ahead and publish the shorter one because I want to give people a feel for what this new view is. And then maybe later, if people get a kind of an overall sense of it. If they wanted more details, uh, I would then later on probably publish the second book as kind of a, a more detailed version of the first book. So, Cool. So, uh, and uh, so, like, do you think that it is possible that we can change? Um, I mean, the, I, I check out like on your website. I believe we have we can get an idea about your book from your website, and that is that you have a new um, point of view that we should look at the at other people and also at the universe um, from a different perspective. Right. Yeah. So I think what we need is a new mythology, although in a lot of ways, it's not really a new mythology. It's really it's taking a lot of the ancient wisdom and sort of updating it with a lot of scientific knowledge that we have now. So in some ways, I'm not really ex saying anything new. I'm just sort of taking what ancient wisdom teachers and applying it to today's science and sort of melding the two together to get this because i think one thing we've lost in this modern age is uh this notion of wisdom and we think you know if you know a lot of stuff that's pretty good but wisdom's on a, of a whole different character and i and we don't hear people talking much about wisdom these days so i think i think we need to get back to these wisdom teachers who have a great things to teach us and even though they might have lived 2,000, 2,500 years ago they still have great insights that we need to use but of course in a way, we have to update them to the modern world because obviously 2,500 is a very different world than it is today. So it needs to be updated. And I think one of the big areas that um, maybe they were not aware of the way we are today is this idea of evolution. And, uh, you know, now we know they didn't know this, that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, going from the Big Bang up to us right now. And so every worldview is kind of based on a creation story. You know, the old mythologies are based on a creation story. And even what I call our modern industrial rational worldview that we've been living under for about 300 to flash 400 years is also in a way based on a creation story. And I think that that creation story, which we now know is the Big Bang, you know, I mean, 
it's given us a lot of information and we've learned a whole lot. So I'm not attacking it. It's not, you know, we can't believe science. We have to believe science. It's shown. But the Big Bang, what's behind the Big Bang is, uh, is a worldview that basically tells us we live in a meaningless, purposeless universe. That, that, you know, that everything was created. The whole Big Bang was an accident. We're accidents. We really shouldn't be here. We don't have any higher purpose really than to be here accidentally. And, you know, when you have a worldview like that, that's so nihilistic, it's going to have negative impacts. And I think it's going to tell people, at least on a subconscious level, that this life is all you have. Go for it. You know, so that means use up all your resources, destroy the environment, because tomorrow we're going to die. And what does it matter? And, you know, there's limited resources. We're going to fight these wars over these resources. And we're going to rip up the climate, which is what we're exactly what we're doing right now. So the idea that, you know, that you can't solve a, a problem from the mentality that created it, you know, we're still in this modern industrial rational worldview, and we're trying to some extent to solve this problem from that point of view, and you can't do it. You've got to pull back and see it, I think, in a much broader perspective to begin to deal with it, not only globally, but even just individually, you know, our way to deal with climate change. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say here that, okay, the, the problem is, I mean, that's what I think, is that uh, yeah. Especially when you come to climate change, I see that most of those who oppose the idea that there is something called climate change usually are uh, from the conservative side. Uh, right. Except for George Carlin, for example, he was not religious at all, yet he has some uh, videos where he mocks the whole idea of saving the planet or the environment and he thinks that we see it from an arrogant point of view that who we are in the first place to save the planet, to say. But also, I see that there is also the religious side, which is very arrogant in the sense that as if that God gave us this whole planet and we can do whatever we want with it. So how you combine these two contradictory points of view. I mean, one of them is almost atheist uh, point of view, and it has no belief in uh, the climate change almost, or that it cannot do anything. And the other side is religious, and it argues for the same thing, that we cannot do anything about it. Well, I think, you know, you have to sort of split it down the middle. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, I don't agree we can't do anything about it or that we should do anything about it. I mean, it's our home. I mean, it's sort of like sitting and watching your home getting burnt down and go, well, you know, I can't really do anything. I just let my home burn down. No, we want to protect our home. I think we're supposed to to move on. You know, the whole history, as I go back in this creation story of 13.8 billion years of evolution, takes us to right now. And what people understand is that we're still evolving. and. Uh, you know, and it, that is our purpose to continue our own evolution, both personally and um, globally uh, as a as a culture. And so for me, um, in my the way I look at it is climate change is sort of the universe's way to wake us up. And it's saying, sure, the modern industrial rational point of view has done a lot of wonderful things. I don't want to say, you know, we have to get rid of the whole thing because we can't because it's given us great advances in science, which we we want to hang on to. It's given us great advances of technology. It's improved the way of life for many people. A lot of people are still left behind, and that's some of the things that need to be taken care of. And it's and it's improved medicine. And you know, there's a lot of areas we don't want to lose that. That they've done a, the modern industrial world has done a lot of good things, but it's also has some limits and some problems. So when we move on to the next one, the idea is you want to include and transcend. So every time you go from one stage to the next, you want to include the best of the, what that earlier stage has and then move on and deal with the problems it's, it's created. So this modern industrial worldview has created this problem, and we need to kind of see ourselves as part of this evolutionary process. And this is a catastrophe that we may not survive, but it's a catastrophe that's put here because the universe is sort of telling us it's time to move on. And I believe if you take a look at the 
the evolution of the universe over 13.8 billion years that, you know, at the very beginning, all the way up to human beings and our advanced mentality, it's just hard to believe that such a development like that over billions and billions of years could have all been just accident and random. Yeah. So my sense of intellig of uh, evolution is what I call intelligent intense intention. And I think there's this intelligence that has this intention that's moving that's moving the uh, process forward and we're and we're a part of that and you know it doesn't stop with us that we need to continue to evolve ourselves um, consciously and uh, and this is the wake-up call that it's time to move on we have to move on with this obsession with materialism and and focusing just on all this wealth and destruction that we have to climb out of it we need I guess you would say a, a spiritual revolution. And I do want to say my brew is not intelligent design because I don't believe as intelligent design theorists would believe that there's a God outside the whole thing that's directing it. I'm, it's more, my position I'd say would be more of a Buddhist that it's the intelligence is inherent in the creative process. It's not something separate, but it's the thing that is driving it. Yes. And the same way that, you know, you have an, an acorn that has the oak tree already embedded in it and it develops into an oak tree if it gets the proper nourishment and everything. And so I believe at the beginning of the Big Bang, before that was this little singularity that's smaller than a, I don't know, a trillionth of an atom. It's the okay. dimensionless, spaceless point. Yes. And everything we see around us, as far as we can see, came out of that little point. And so everything is interconnected. We're all interconnected. And within that little point was human beings. In fact, the physicist Freeman Dyson said, the more I study evolution and the architecture of the universe, he says, the more I start to think that the universe knew we were coming. In other words, we were there. We're a part of the plan. And so it's up to us to save this thing. And it's it's not arrogance, and it's not that we can do whatever we want. I mean, to me, those are the ideas we just have to get rid of, and we have to move move beyond those ideas. Yes, uh, I think that probably um, your point of view might become like a worldwide, um, I don't know, like many people have started doing it, what, what you said, just said, uh, but I, think that maybe you should also focus on the future on more widening your because I know there is a political result from outcome from your point of view because you know to, to create a new world or a new point perspective you know that there are for, for example there are dictators in the, on this earth there are bad people who are who are trying to destroy it as much as possible. And uh, so, but yeah, like change comes from one individual sometimes, and then the idea spreads <laughs> everywhere. So what do you think about, uh, for example, American foreign policy? Like, how can we convince regimes or, for let's say, like, China or North Korea or somewhere else. There are some tyrants and dictators who just see themselves. So how you how you implement all this this philosophy in every aspect? Yeah. Well, I just think it starts with a an awakening in this country, and you know, I don't know if there's anything good about Trump getting elected. It's that he's woken people up. You know, it was always my fear, and I did vote for Hillary Clinton, and I wanted her to become president over Trump, but it was always my fear that if she got in, everybody, there's always a sense when a Democrat gets in, everybody would be like, oh, okay, we've taken care of the problem, but climate change was continuing to get worse. Yes. And so Trump has been a disaster, but one thing he's done is to sort of waken up the country and the world, and especially dealing with this coronavirus issue, we've really seen how incompetent he is. Yes. And so it always, for some reason, human beings don't seem to learn until there's a disaster and something has to shake that worldview and now we're at the point where that worldview is getting shaken and all of a sudden people are looking out at their 
in LA, they have clean air. In New Delhi, they have clean air for the first time. People are saying, I think Bill McKibben, McKibben of 350.org said people are now gulping clean air in some places for the first time in their lives. And, you know, it sets a precedent. And I think, you know, out of the ashes of these disasters, something new can be born. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a growth of awareness. And as Bernie Sanders said, it, you have to create a movement. And I think, you know, at least as Americans, we have to at least start in this country and, uh, you know, and get our leadership right and get the views right. And then we can go out there and on climate change and these other issues really, really stand for higher values. And I think people in those other countries, you can see it in Hong Kong. You can see worldwide protests everywhere, all over the Middle East, all over Africa, Europe. People want a change. It's there, but the leaders are holding it down. And, you know, I think the U.S. can can be can uh, can be a beacon, you know, maybe for the future for everybody, not as a dictatorial power of, you know, exploiting other countries resources, but a real moral and spiritual leader for the country. And, uh, you know, that transcends all different individual religions and everything. So I think, you know, it starts at home, it starts with the individual. And, you know, it just it expands out from there. I think U.S. has got a lot of issues they need to take care of first before before we can really become a force of the world right now. And hopefully we can start that in November. <laughs> yes, hopefully. Um, yeah, like I, I, I have seen that one of the biggest problems with Trump is that these people, especially those who um, I think they are kind of have kind of illness because they defend him no matter what he does. So yeah. it's a kind of cult, like they don't provide you any evidence or scientific points of view or, yeah, they just will defend him no matter what. So I think America has gone backward and you are right on that point that uh, suddenly we all woke up that we discovered that something is wrong here because right. I myself, I was a Republican until 2016. Oh. Yeah, and when uh, Trump came, I said that, no way, I'm not staying in this camp. So, and that's why, like, um, I see it very interesting that you, you are driving Americans to uh, see this uh, wrong and see what is the right thing to do, and that is to see the whole earth as united that we all are are humans before anything so um okay so wh wh how you combine um, the care for the climate and at the same time the worldwide problem of poverty for example because many people as you know need jobs they need uh, the creation of jobs factories and this is uh, like a very tricky area because you create new jobs, but also you get the environment like, uh, yeah, yeah, like we get the pollution and the yeah, climate gets uh, very bad. So uh, how, how you, how, what, what you will try to do here? Well, I think as a lot of people are, are, uh, trying to support is like a strong Green New Deal. Yes. And so now, especially as the economy sort of collapsed and oil prices are actually negative now, they actually yes. will pay people to take oil off their hands. Um, I think this is the perfect opportunity to, to slowly get off our oil addiction and move into a strong green economy, green our energy system. And as people have said, this will create lots of good paying jobs around the world, good clean jobs. And it seems to me that can be something that can be fostered around around the world also. I mean, every country needs to create these kinds of things. And I think, you know, we probably need stronger international institutions that, you know, run more on a humanitarian moral basis that can aid other countries. And, you know, once we start realizing we're in this together, we're starting to see more and more that these are planetary problems. The virus we're suffering now is affecting everybody. The climate change is affecting everybody. 
And the more we see that, the more we realize we need global institutions to begin to take care of this. And we're all in this together, you know, either as a planet, we're going to sink together or we're going to rise up together. And so we have to sort of embrace, you know, everybody on this planet. And once we, as we see, we're more interconnected, the need for these huge defense budgets and wars and everything, I think people are going to realize that is so 20th century. We don't need that anymore. We don't have to be run by this fear all the time. I mean, it's going to be a gradual process, but I think, you know, we have to start moving in that direction and greening the economy can provide good, well-paying jobs, also improve the environment and really create, you know, something new on this planet. Um, obviously, not going to be easy because climate change has gone on too far and there's going to be a lot of repercussions already kind of baked in. We're going to go through some really difficult times. But as Al Gore was just saying the other day, it's not too late to, to head off the worst parts of it. And we can adapt. There's going to be some bad things happening, but we can adapt. We can still pull this thing out. But we need to act soon. We don't have any time. And that's why, you know, another four years of Trump could absolutely be disastrous to this planet as he's even now just lifting up lifting all the environmental regulations and everything he's using this crisis to just basically not only destroy democracy trying to destroy democracy but really in his way destroy the planet so you know i think there's only one way forward and we're at this pivotal pivotal point right now and we have to grab it and and move forward and i believe there there is this awakening that's happening so I mean, I think the new economy is going to be clean and it can provide good jobs. I think this notion between jobs and environment is a, is a false notion. And as we're seeing it more and more, and I don't think that's, that's the real, the real problem there. We can have both. That's really good. I mean, um, for example, and even if you take a look at the American history, you see that, for example, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he done like some great job with when when he created the national parks and uh, he like he gave them a kind of um, protection. But now Trump is doing just the opposite. He's trying to even give like these uh, natural areas to businesses and companies right. to exploit it and even destroy it. Right. And uh, if we take a look at the uh, at China, I believe, uh, because uh, they have a tyrannical government, like people have no say in it. That's why you see in these um, states and nations, they suffer a lot from pollution and right. bad air. So uh, do, you, do you think that America is really going to learn from these tyrannical states? Because as much as we, I see Republicans talking about China, for example, but they are trying to do with Trump just what the Communist Party is doing with President Xi or Kim of North Korea. So what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a struggle. There's no guarantees that we're going in the right direction. That's why everybody's voice and everybody's what everybody individual does is important. You know, nothing's guaranteed. There are no guarantees, you know. We could go the way as a lot of the dictatorships, you know, uh, like Orban in, in Hungary or in Poland or, you know, in Egypt or any of these other places. Um, we could go in that direction very easily. It's definitely a possibility. You know, we're, we're, we're at the precipice here. We can go, we can go one way or we can go the other way. And I think, you know, it all depends on the people, how they, you know, and not in mass, but also each individual has to kind of look in them inside themselves and, you know, ask themselves, what kind of world do they want for themselves and for their children? Um, because, you know, if we, if we manage to turn this around and in the future, you know, people will be writing stories. They'll be writing new myths about what happened in this age. You know, they'll look back and say, if it wasn't for those people back there in the early 21st century that stood up and made these big changes, we wouldn't even be here today. You know, we owe them such a gratitude of thanks. And this, and we don't do it for that, but, but that will be, we are at this heroic time right now. And, uh, we can, we can either answer the call or, or not. And, you know, it's really up to us and it's up to each individual in their own heart of hearts to, to make that decision. It's, uh, it's, 
the answer's blown in the wind, as they say. <laughs> yeah. No uh, guarantees. Well, I can't but agree with you on that because, um, as you say, that you know, I, I see, for example, um, Republicans, um, some, for example, I made um, an audio about a Republican guy who was talking about, oh, this beautiful America, it has a natural places you can see but at the same time i said well that's a contradiction because he's now is supporting a president who is trying to uh, destroy this nature i mean this country is beautiful because we are trying to save uh, right. natural resources and right. uh, you you remind me <laughs> of uh, the famous philosopher spinoza but Right. Somewhat, you are a more, um, I, but, but are you are going to a different direction. So, uh, how how can okay? Maybe your can you make your philosophy more, um, like can, can you bring some Republicans to our side, for example, because the new atheism, the militant atheism, I believe, made those Republicans angry because they think that the new atheism made life meaningless and uh but your book is offering a meaningful uh side to this that no we have a meaning and so can 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 you go over that that how you will use even religion itself to support this climate change issue and educate people about it well i think that um as you say, the new worldview does have a spiritual component, although I don't want to, I mean, there's a lot of, I don't mean to just, in general, I'm talking about the Big Bang as being, it is sort of atheist, it's meaningless and purposeless, but I don't mean to denigrate atheist per se, because, you know, a lot of people are atheists, they're good people, they care about the future, so I mean, you don't necessarily have to believe exactly what I'm saying, although I think, you know, because I think a lot of atheists if you actually ask them questions about, you know, do you believe in God? And they say no, but they usually mean, they usually think you're talking about this God, like a Christian God or a Jewish God, or maybe the Muslim God that's outside of creation, that's, you know, directing things. You know, no, I don't believe in that. But then if you start talking more about kind of what I'm talking about, which is more inherent, in the, then some of them might go, well, maybe something like that I might accept. So you got to be careful. When you say you believe in God, you always have to say, well, how do you define God? you know, to make sure that's what they do. And I think uh, as for religious people, it does have a spiritual component. You know, I look at the creation stories, you go back to the mythologies, even the creation stories in the Bible. And, you know, we can't take them as literally true. We know they're not true. But the one thing they have was they had meaning and purpose. So people liked them because they believed there was a God looking out for them they had a place in the universe. And they did these certain things. They were going to go to heaven. It gave them comfort. And then the Big Bang comes along, kind of throws all that out, but doesn't really replace it with anything. We get a lot of knowledge, which we need. But, you know, even if some of these religious people were inclined to believe in the science, they kind of go, I don't want to believe in this meaningless, purposeless world. That, that makes me feel so bad. I'd rather just, even though I know all your arguments might even be right, I want, I want to stay with this world view that has a meaning and purpose you know and that there's a god in it and i have a place and it makes them feel at home so i think for those that might be willing to embrace the scientific world except they don't like the lack of meaning and purpose in it that i offer them kind of an alternative because they can keep their meaning and purpose and also embrace the science that comes with it so i think at least for some people that could be a bridge. It could be a bridge for, for both groups to come together. And of course, there's always going to be people that are not going to be convinced by anything. You know, I mean, you just, you just can't convince them and you can do your best, but then, you know, yeah. and I believe they're just a small minority and you just have to, to work on those that are open to, to change is yeah. the way I would deal with it. So like flat earthers, maybe <laughs> because yeah, I, I mean, climate deniers, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, the climate deniers are, you know, it's at the point where it's really not, it's not really any, it's not worth the time to, to fight with them anymore. I mean, I think they're in such a minority. It's just, you know, unfortunately they're in power, so you have to deal with them. But as, a, as an idea, 
you know, it, you know, there's just nothing to, to say to people like that. You just have to get them out of office. Yes. So, yes. And I think, you know, the climate change problem is so horrible because we're talking about the end of life that even people I think who accept climate change still are not quite willing to accept the immediacy of the problem because it's too terrible. And that's why we don't see strong actions. And I think the real fear of climate change that people have is not so much climate change, but it's the fear and doubt and whatnot, the powerlessness to do anything that they get when they think about it. You know, so the real problem climate change isn't climate change. It's the way people feel when they think about it. It makes them feel terrible. It makes them feel weak. Like they can't do anything. It's like looking at a black hole. And so you just, you go, I don't know what to do about that. I'm going to go do something else. I don't want to think about it. Other people can solve that problem. I, it's too much for me. But I think part of what my philosophy is that we need to face those inner fears and those inner uncertainties and we have to go through them. And uh, because on the other side is what I would call our true selves, our eternal selves. And that's, that's the self that will, that will tell you who you are and what your purpose is on this planet at this time. And that's how you have to go through that stuff. So, you know, I hope in the, the new mythology of the magical universe that I'm talking about that, you know, it calls on people to have the courage to face all of those fears and go into them and deal with them, you know, journal about them, write about them, talk about them, whatever, and just deal with them and get them out because on the other side is your true self. It's sort of like, you know, it used to be when LA had the big smog over it, you know, you'd, you'd take off and then you'd fly through the smog and you couldn't see anything and it was terrible, but then you'd break through into the clear blue sky. It's kind of like that, you know, you got to go through your own smog to get to that clear blue sky on the, on the other side. So that's, that's, that's what is known in mythology as Joseph Campbell will talk about the hero's journey. It's that journey inward that, you know, we all need to take to, to really find out who we are and what we should be doing with our lives. Yes. So uh, just, uh, okay, can you let, tell us also a little bit about uh, when your book is coming, uh, will be available for people to buy it and also maybe on Kindle or, yeah, can you give us some details who is the publisher? Well, it's going to be self-published, and I'm still working on it. Right now, I'm just starting to try to do an audio book version of it. Um, but eventually, it's going to be hopefully in a couple, two or three months. I mean, it's been it's been a work in progress forever. Uh, but hopefully, in a couple of months, it'll be out as an ebook, uh, as a Kindle book. But I'm also working now on an audio book for it, and um, and maybe even a a, a small hardback so book also. It will be available on Audible. I mean, maybe you should try. Well, it'll be available on Kindle, on Amazon, and then uh, yes. I guess also I have to learn all about that, how that all works. But yeah, and then and on my website, I think I can sell it off my website. Although there's certain, I don't know, I have to learn all the rules. But yes. yeah, so if uh, I do have a new website, so I think you're going to show the the thing there, so people can kind of stay up to date yes. on it. I also post blogs on there that you can read more and get a a broader view of, of exactly what I'm talking about and, you know, by all means, respond to the blogs and ask questions, um, uh, offer counterpointing points of view. I love counterpoints of view. I love people challenging it. I love to debate and discuss these kinds of things. You know, I just say, you know, try to keep it polite and nice and respect for each other and respect differences and points of view and whatnot and, uh, you know, act as what they call netiquette, I guess. So, but yeah, other than that, you know, I welcome disagreements or questions or anything or support too. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I really remember when I was your student at school, I, believe me, your class was the most enjoyable class ever. Like I have taken many classes, but the way you teach, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> and uh, I am glad that uh, and I'm honored by knowing you. Uh, um, and I believe that people should follow your example on this. And yeah, you offer great things to us, to American people also and everyone. And I hope to 
see you again in another uh, other interviews maybe in the future and yeah uh, well thank you thank <laughs> you very much for all those kind compliments i really enjoyed you in the class you're always very participatory and so any teacher loves somebody who participates and not only just participates but participates with good thoughtful thoughtful comments that also provoke other students or inspire other students to contribute also so you are a great asset in the class Thank and you. You know, who knows why our paths crossed back then and now they're crossing again so yes we'll see how it all plays out yeah, yeah and i'd be happy to, to to do another interview sometime in the future if that works out yes uh but just before i uh, we, we are done with the interview are you working on you are working on two books right well, actually, in a way, both books are finished. I'm more working right now on the audiobook of the, the quick one. And then uh, and and once I kind of get that done and then I'll, then I'll have to see I'm getting the idea. I should try to publish all of the ebook, the audiobook, and a, a hard copy book all at the same time. Cool. But maybe I'll change my mind and just do like the ebook and the audiobook first and then maybe put a hard copy out there later. I'm not sure. But you know, um, because I want to get the book out pretty quickly, um, it'll be available on Kindle, Kindle at, a, at a pretty pretty low price. So yes. um, just because I want to get this out into the world as much as possible in yes. these critical times. Yeah, for, especially before November the 3rd. <laughs> I believe we, yeah. Should, yeah. Yeah, we should change things. Thank you right. so much. Okay, well, thank you, Sohel. I really appreciate you having me on your podcast. You too. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.